sheet over there. We can track our visitors. So if you add your name to that. And the first question is, are there any amendments to the agenda? We need to um, um, I guess I'll make a motion to eliminate um, item nine. Is that right? Yes. Well, I need one executive session. Okay. Um, is there a motion to adopt the agenda as, we, as amended? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay. Um, at this time, we are open for public comments. So if there is a person who would like to be recognized for public comments, uh, you can raise your hand or your Zoom hand or just come in. We're a pretty small group. Uh, uh, Tess. Um, hi, this is my second meeting as the Student Council uh, School Board Representative. I'm happy to be here. Um, I guess a quick update from the Student Council is that we're continuing our efforts to um, increase student, um, I guess, engagement. Um, our last school dance was the homecoming dance, which was very successful. So we decided to have another dance before um, the year ends, which is on the 15th. So that'll be good. Um, and I think we're going to start working on some efforts to um, make some sort of or um, the advisories to make them more engaging for students. So that'll be a new um, topic for the agenda, which is exciting. So yeah, thank you for having me. All right, thank you to Tess Bilal, who is our school board representative. I uh, shouldn't say school board, our <laughs> student council representative to the board, thank you. Is there anybody else? Okay, seeing no other um, public comments, we're going to move into the reports. And Sherry is straight here from Washington, D.C. Oh, can Good, you evening. Good evening. It's kind of strange to be on the big screen, but thank you all. And thank you for allowing me to take this time to be in, in Washington for some professional development. Um, just a couple things that I wanted to review. I know in my evaluation, there was a question about what kinds of professional development am I doing? I wanted to share with you that I'm currently working with the University of Washington's Center for Educational Leadership um, as part of their Principal Supervision Academy, which includes uh, six in-person days in Vermont, uh, working with us some half days and some coaching as I work with principals in developing inquiry cycles around data. It's really it's exciting work, and I'm really glad to be able to work with the University of Washington on this topic. Um, earlier this month, uh, during our Teacher and Service Day, uh, one of my goals is to work with the Unified Arts team to identify what their vision as we um, morph into this new elementary schedule. We had a great day. Mary Guggenberger and um, Lori B uh, Balland also um, was there with me, talking about what our vision is for Unified Arts. Um, what the impact on their programming is uh, based on this new elementary schedule that we're working towards and thinking about what are the variables that impact those decisions. So we had a really exciting day and I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to working with them again in March during that all day in service. Um, another piece of work that we're looking at is our continuous improvement plan. Um, a number of our board meetings, conversations about how do we really collect the data and assess whether the strategies that we put in place, the goals we've put in place have made a difference. And so we're looking at some short, medium, and long-term goals and how we measure that. We're also collecting ongoing data and data in different ways. And <clears throat> within maybe not in January, but soon after, we'll be sharing that information in the board in terms of what that plan looks like. And then currently, and, and Corinne Parks, uh, don't see her tonight, but one of her questions was, we were talking about working with um, Ed Leader 21, and she's like, are you sure that's the group you want to work with? And that was a great question. Uh, one of the reasons why Jen and I are here in DC, we're looking at working with a group called Learning Forward. Uh, thus far, uh, we've been here since Saturday night, Sunday, yesterday, we did all day training. Um, my work was on belonging and uh, creating a promise with students, uh, faculty, and community around our, our equity work. 
Um, today was on challenging conversations and um, how to gather teacher feedback. Um, the next few days, I'll be working on school family partnerships, um, addressing controversial and sensitive curriculum, as well as equity in the classroom. So I'm excited to be part of this. Um, the last day we'll be here on Wednesday, uh, we'll be touring a brand new high school in Arlington School District. In fact, it's where Jennifer Jen went to high school, but it's a brand new building. Thought it would be an opportunity to see what a new high school facility looks like um, in this area. So that's my report. Thank you. Any questions for Sherry? Uh, mm -hmm. Corinne, your hand is up. Thank you. Yes, sorry, my, my video is not working. I, I know we're probably trying to get through stuff. So just um, really briefly, uh, I'm curious, Sherry, if you could share just a tidbit of of the idea um, around the unified arts, sort of your you were calling your your vision, and also sort of the ways that the new scheduling um, uh, consultant or or ideas that that came with that came with that um, are affecting. Uh, unified arts or may or may affect them? Great question. Thank you. Um, I will say originally we met in September, there were lots of concerns about how does that work? How do we continue to have the impact we want to have? Um, at the end of that full day, we're talking about two different models. Um, really importantly, the unified arts teachers, one, want to think about that term. Does that really describe who they are? But how do are those classes connect with our literacy and mathematics schools. And working with our literacy facilitator, Julie Brown, around what are some of the um, curriculum pieces. And so is there a menu of uh, content that UA can connect with and support teachers, as well as is there are there opportunities to do some concentrations over periods of time? So we haven't made any specific um, decisions about that. Uh, and it could be an and uh, instead of one model over the other. They're excited. We're going to talk in March, but um, they've asked that our literacy facilitator, Julie Brown, meet with them when she's in the schools to talk about what are the different units and where some partnerships can form. So uh, I think they're excited about the work. I'm excited about the work. We talk about how every minute in the schedule really needs to support those goals, and they are totally on board with that. So thank you, Corinne, for that question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Raph, you are up next. Uh, good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Two things I think to share with you tonight. So um, as part of our ongoing cybersecurity efforts, we're rolling out two-factor requirements for two-factor authentication or two-step verification for all staff. So we're in the process of working with staff right now to, to do that um, with the goal of having um, all our staff members have it enabled before the holiday break. Um, so we're we're going through that step right now, um, answering a lot of questions, but providing staff members an opportunity to either use their personal cell phones or to use a security key bought by the district for their logins um, to their to their accounts. Um, this is a precursor to all cybersecurity and is really fundamental for us. And as part of our cybersecurity insurance, it's one of the basic tenets that it's all based off of. So it's a really important step we have to take. Um, the other piece is I'm excited to announce that after many months, we are we have um, EC Fiber providing fiber to this building. Um, and so um, on Thursday, we would begin to have the installation done here in the building. So we'll be upgrading the bandwidth of this building to support more meetings like this and more work in general. Um, so just wanted to give a shout out to Joe and his team because this was mm -hmm. a, a real challenge getting the fiber to this building. and. Um, with their help, we were able to, to, to get it done. Um, so we're increasing our bandwidth here to be able to do more. Great. Thanks. 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 So in terms of the uh, two-factor um, verification for things like Fire or Google Drive that we have policies on, we're not using it. So will that, should, should we be using it too? I mean, should that be worth yeah, I, yes. Eventually, we will ask board members to do it as well. Um, we're, we're sort of going through various stages. What we're finding is that 
it kind of helps to have um, different deadlines for different groups just so that we can kind of support different folks as they move through. But yes, eventually we, we will ask you all to do it as well um, as part of just basic cybersecurity. Okay, any other questions for Raf? Thank you, Raf. Um, Director of Student Support Services. Good evening, I'm Shana Kalinsky, the Director of Student Support Services, and I'd like to highlight some of the work uh, from our um, department this month. Um, we are deep in working on transition planning for students in grades 9 to 12 with middle school to follow. And this transition work is a continuation of what we began last year with Emily Maloon. And the process is a multi-year set of steps and actions taken to prepare students and families who receive special education services for life after Woodstock Union High School uh, in terms of career readiness and having access to supports and services that they might need in the community. And it's done with a community partnership with agencies that exist in our geographic locale. And it's as much for the parents and the families as it is for the students. Um, some of the other work is uh, surrounding analysis of progress data from the last intervention cycles and creation of intervention plans. And in the last meeting, it was asked, you know, when would we see the fruits of all our work in literacy and mathematics? And what we didn't get to talk about is that cognia starts in third grade. So the students who have had the opportunity to engage in this work haven't even gotten to take cognia yet. But the tools that we're using at the local level, like the Forefront Math Screener and Dibbles, are things that we're looking at every day. And when we assessed students through progress monitoring, we also noticed that there were many students who had made progress such that they exited from intervention in the first term of the year. And that's something that we look at and we look at the data and we look at the student's progress, adjust instruction, um, on an ongoing basis and with the um, MTSS or multiple tiers of um, support team. Um, the other thing that we've been working on is responding to some critical staffing and student needs. That's taking an inordinate <laughs> amount of time, but we are continuing to work also with special educators on the complex changes to the special education eligibility rules and working with the school psychologist on developing some tools to help special educators as well as regular educators understand how that impacts what they do every day. And they're even creating um, a PD to help our principals and other administrators understand what's happening uh, across special education and Vermont as well. All right, are there any questions for Shana? Thank you, Shana. Thank you. Did you, did you have no. Okay. <laughs> All right. From the Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so my written board report provides an update on teacher use of professional development learning benefit, um, Title I parent and family engagement procedures, and a look ahead at our winter assessment window. Um, but I wanted to take a minute to talk about um, some of the things that are happening in our schools. So on a regular basis, our teachers are creating engaging learning opportunities for our students. And uh, tonight I wanted to provide a snapshot of one of them in particular. So on November 17th, uh, sixth grade students at the Prosper Valley School invited the public in uh, to their school for a water symposium, which was a presentation of their learning about water issues locally and globally. The breadth of their work was impressive from podcasts capturing local experiences with this summer's flooding to scientific water quality measurements on local bodies of water uh, to deep reflection on what it's like to live in places like South Sudan with water issues. Uh, the event included a bake sale where students raised money for um, the Iron Giraffe Challenge in support of clean water in South Sudan. And what I saw with every interaction I had with a Prosper Valley student was the portrait of a graduate. I saw stewardship, skillful communication, and academic excellence in action. Uh, so I wanted to say congratulations to the sixth grade on a successful celebration of learning and to the Prosper Valley team for developing and supporting a rich learning experience for all of us, including me. 
that's my report. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Any questions and comments for Jen? All right, thank you. Um, finally, we have our student representatives. I don't say finally because you're the left one, but you are fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I can, I can go first. So um, the Superintendent's Student Advisory Council is the group that works really directly with Ms. Souza in terms of coordinating the leadership summit and also just offering like broader student input to the superintendent. And we realized this year we had like an identity crisis that we don't have a way to elect new members. So we've been onboarding a dozen new underclassmen members, so all sophomores and freshmen, um, which is going to make the group about four times as big as it's ever been, but also is going to set us up well for the future. So there's going to be a good crew, steady stream of students coming in, <clears throat> taking over Aiden and I over the next couple of years, um, and that should be good to see. So we've been uh talking with them and then uh we've been also able to break into these focus groups so Aiden has been focusing a lot on the high school code of conduct and he's also been working pretty closely with Mr. Smale on that so that's been cool to see um they're kind of redoing that and then I've been kind of working um and dealing also with the social action club on conversations about the high school mascot where we should go with that um and also there was also a group that's just focusing on coordinating the leadership summit so it's cool to work with that new team. Um, and then also in terms of just like, I think as Tess was saying, like student engagement, um, Mr. Tancredi, I don't think he's online, but um, he like talks about this ad nauseum, like he loves um, this kind of sense of belonging. So I think it's cool to see the student council taking a bigger role in terms of like fun, lighthearted, no agenda, just community engagement activities, like these dances and kind of silly things that I think up that sense of belonging for our students at the high school. Great, thank you very much. <clears throat> Owen and Aiden. Can you guys hear me all right? Yes. Okay, um, so yeah, I'll just kind of pick up where Owen left off. Um, I'll give a little bit about the uh, work that I'm doing with the co conduct. Um, we're kind of just like kind of picking up from where we left off in the leadership summit. Um, in the leadership summit, we did a breakout session where we took a review of the code of conduct we have and uh, the code of conduct in the Ithaca School District. Just kind of compare and contrast them and notice that ours is a little you know, outdated, doesn't adequately articulate rights and responsibilities of students. And we want to update it and make it more reflective on our student body and staff body and also accessible to them. So um, our plan is to get a working group together by our, I mean, Mr. Snell and I, our plans to get a working group together um, consisting of students um, from a vast different like clubs and representing different um, like cliques almost of students. So we can get as much input as possible. And um, right now we're just recruiting some students to start that working group up. And then our next steps will just take a deep dive in the code of conduct and start kind of taking it apart piece by piece, um, trying to reformat it and make it more relevant to students and teachers and staff. Um, on other notes, student body specifically, um, fall sports have ended. Um, a lot of teams did very well on their final championships and playoff matches. We're now going into winter sports where we have the first week of winter sports this week, um, or first week of winter games, I should say. So we're very excited about that. Um, we also had a Thanksgiving themed Best Wednesday on November 15th um which was very students were really engaged in that we did uh holiday themed games raffles and we had some announcements from zach's place and other groups and as owen was saying and tess as well it's really nice to see these um students come together and for these um school spirit activities and uh one last thing the safe school ambassadors um uh, consisting of students grades at eight through 12 participated in a two-day long retreat at artistry where they um, practiced it and did some self-reflection and practice and learn some skills needed to resolve conflict and diffuse negative incidents and also support their peers. And the group also accepted some new eighth grade members and student body is really excited to see them grow and develop as leaders. Well, thank you very much. Are there any comments or questions for Aiden or Owen? Corinne? Uh, yeah, just Quick question. Amazing stuff that you guys are both doing. Um, uh, I really uh, 
appreciate to especially that um safe school ambassadors program that's really cool um curious for your superintendent student advisory council how do you decide or select um you know who is invited into that council um we picked from the students that attended the leadership summit so it was kind of a just optional uh interest sheet that we put out and basically everyone that put their name down we we considered sent them an email and if they showed up for the meeting uh they're in so basically the prerequisite was um be interested in the summit and check your email <laughs> yeah. awesome cool thank you anyone else i have a question that's kind of off topic but i'd be interested in um your feedback on how uh the recent oil spell at the school affected your uh school day i, I was at an orthopedist appointment Aiden, were you were you there i was in school um it was definitely some challenges for students. I know there was about 50 students who had to go home. Um, there was definitely a strong smell, and a lot of students had a headache from that. Smell but, headaches and stuff. Yeah, yeah but sure. our maintenance team handled it very well. Um, they were on top of it, and um, we I, I know personally I felt safe. I didn't feel like there was, like, feel like I was, like, there was a seriously threatening issue. But yeah. um, the students who did, um, need to go home they did go home and there was also a lot of communication amongst uh parents and teachers and staff um so i think it was handled pretty well and um the students who were affected about it got the help they need all right thank you all right i believe we're going to move now into the time scheduled appointments and the first one is appointing an owner's rep with uh ben cord and Jim Pat. We're going to Jim present, even though he's feeling absolutely terrible this evening. Um, so just to kind of frame this up, um, we're going to hear uh, just kind of a readout and some recommendations from Jim. Uh, you may recall that you know, going back, I guess, a year or so, uh, we had this uh, process set in place where um, you know, we, in March, went to the voters, right, for a million and a half dollars uh, for architectural uh, services. There was a lot of debate and discussion over that. We put that on the ballot. As part of that, there was 150K uh, for the construction firm. And then as another kind of in, in the process, um, the hiring of an owner's rep. And the, the purpose here, one of the purposes is value engineering. Uh, presently, we are waiting for PC Construction, the firm that we chose, uh, the construction firm, to give us our uh, costing information. And we'll see that on, we, the new build committee, will see that on Friday. Um, but then, from there, the uh, owner's rep will get that and then look at it and look for opportunities to potentially save money on the, uh, the final pricing for the project. And then um, all along the project, they also have a role in kind of monitoring the significant events that happen uh, you know, during the construction of the new facility. Do you have anything you'd add in terms of the role of the owner's rep? No, I think you covered it well. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we put the, the um, RFP out, we published it, in the paper and we sent it directly to three different potential um, owners rep organizations. Two of them decided to bid, the third one decided that they were so busy they could not take on this, this opportunity. <clears throat> and as a group, we interviewed the two candidates who did submit um, proposals. One is a company called PCI Project Consulting Incorporated. Um, they're out of Montpelier. And the other one is BIS uh, Construction Consultants, and they're out of both Etna, New Hampshire, and um, I believe the Burlington area. Um, we had a good interview of both of them. Um, what we felt was that um, the low bidder was PCI, the one from Montpelier. And what we felt from the interviews was that the breadth of knowledge that their team brought brought a lot more to the table than the other company. The other company, most of the team were project managers, where PCI, they had a facilities director, a project manager, and an architect. So they had a much broader spectrum of knowledge and experience 
And um, after the interviews, and I went into the interviews not sure, you know, which one I wanted. Um, I think we all agreed that we wanted to recommend today PCI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, just to add on top of that, um, from being in those interviews, uh, both of the firms are currently engaged on the Burlington project. One is the owner's rep there. The other is what they call the clerk of the works. For our project, we'd like to not to do a, a clerk of the works type role, have the owner's rep kind of, um, you know, handle those functions. So you know, that wasn't a real, um, you know, distinguishing factor between the two. Um, I guess I'll make a motion so we can have a discussion, um, but I'll make the motion to uh, for the district to hire um, PCI construction as the owner's rep. Second. And for discussion, the fixed fee for the pre-bond work is $20,000. Um, when the project gets approved, the fixed fee for the next three years is three hundred thousand dollars. Okay, we probably need to vote on the motion. There's no other discussion. And and yes, well, no, I mean it's this discussion. We vote the motion. Then we vote the motion. Then we can have discussion. No, you discussed and then you vote. That's purpose. Okay. okay. <laughs> Any further discussion around? Um, I'm just discussion. curious, what what was the bid by the other party? I know this was the low bid, but. Were they even in the same ballpark? They were 499000 for everything. So they were 20475 for the pre construction and 478 for the, the construction. Um, they also plan on putting a lot more hours in. And we went into this having an idea. Uh, Joe and I sat with the calendar and went through. And came up with what we thought was an idea and the um and pci's hours more closely matched our idea of what they needed to do for him yeah it seemed like pci had thought about it a lot more yeah. than it is any other questions okay all those in favor of appointing pci please say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed all right, thank you very much. The next um, item on our agenda is to set limits on Vermont Public High School choice. Um, Terry, are you prepared to speak to that or do, do you want uh, me to put that in or Garen? I don't know, but oh, Garen, I'm sorry, go ahead. Thank you, Garen. Oh, sure, hello, everyone. Um, so as far as the, the school choice, I'd recommend keeping it the same as we've done for some time. You can see in the report that we wouldn't be able to bring in additional students until I believe it's 2026, but we've been working it at six students per year. Again, this is the, the statewide school choice, not the tuition-based town to just differentiate. There's those schools, towns without an operating district, and those are the tuition-based. These are students who can elect to attend any school in Vermont, and the the finances stay at the school of the sending school they came from. So these are students who come to enrich our student body, or there's reasons we think it's good to have them come here, but I, I recommend we keep it at a limited number. It seems to serve us well. Is there any discussion from the board on that? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, ahead, why Mom. are you? Oh, go ahead, Madam Chair. Yes. Thank you. Um, what what is the basis for your statement that we would not be able to take any students until 2026? Yeah, great question, Bob. Because we're limited at, at six per um, per year at the current board, and we brought in several ninth graders last this current school year. So as far as occupying that that total total base. Okay. Well, as many of you know, I've long been a believer that I think this require this this limit is is crazy uh, at a time when we're attempting to uh, bring kids from all over the state if not all over the country and maybe even foreign countries to our schools uh, it makes no sense to me to have this limit especially set so low the statute does allow for schools to waive the limits in any given year the board uh, so 
we have an opportunity right now to raise the limit, in which case we could bring in anybody who wants to come. Uh, so I'm in favor of doing that. I don't think I don't think we should limit it at six. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Bob. A few years ago, on the on the for the high school board, I did a report. When does it really impact our our dollar piece? And we looked at we had a concentration of say twenty students at single grade level would really take when we just see real uh, budgetary impacts. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, no, that's my question, Karen. Can you clarify? I thought this this school choice program is the one where we take students from other school districts but don't get to count them in our ADM. Is that correct? That is correct. So the only the benefits are having people in the school for the diversity's sake, but as far as dollars, no money follows these students. That's correct. So what I had looked at is what the capacity of the school is and the capacity when we would have to um, add additional staff. So when I last did a report to the to the board, this is the, the previous high school board, what I found is if we had a real concentration of students at a certain grade level, then we might have to increase staffing but we're looking at what the capacity is with the current staffing, they're kind of keeping at the same level. Thanks, Jen. Uh, yes, Lara, is there any way to set a limit per grade or do we just have to set a limit for the whole district? We haven't looked at that before, Bob? so I don't, I don't know the answer to that one. Bob? Yeah, the statute uh, is silent on that. Um, and the reason it probably wouldn't work anyway from year to year is that oftentimes uh, these young people would come to the school and decide to stay at, stay at the school. So it'd be pretty unworkable if they were moving from grade to grade and there were different limits for different grades, in my opinion. But the statute's silent on it. Anybody else? Well, what I'm, what I'm, so what I'm hearing is that the financial impact to us would happen if we got too many in the same grade. If we're only taking six, then we're not having one per grade, but could we just say we want one or two per grade and then they would just flow into our student body without impacting us poorly and we could take more? Uh, Sherry. So um what's interesting is that our classes are not grade specific so they're not just freshman classes or sophomore or juniors or senior you know all of our classes are pretty diversified so it doesn't mean if we say six per grade you might have a different concentration so it does impact can be impacted differently because we don't have grade specific classes for the most part correct garen yeah that's that's well said thanks sherry um Maybe some scenarios as far as when when does it come into play might help too. So sometimes a family might might have to move out of our district for some sort of reason, and the student is in the eleventh grade, and they, can they can they complete their high school career with us? So that's some kind of the, the flexibility. Or the other ones will be um, for some reason things aren't working well at somebody's home school, so they'll ask to come to our school. So that's where there's like a diversity of in and out, those kind of different places. And then of course there may be programming that people are accessing. But as I, I think about this, and I think what Bob's saying too, as far as a limitation on, on 26, there is, it makes me think that to have some, some leeway for some of those things that happen during the school year, there's ways we're really able to support kids who've been with us for some time, um, when for often financial reasons, they have to move out of the district. So um, maybe we'd like to, the board would like to consider um, having some room annually too, to allow people to come in rather than hitting that limit. So, Garen, what would we need to do to have that happen? If we if we set it to six, and number seven shows up for good reasons, we want to accept that student. How do we handle that? And would that be like a side agreement or friendly amendment? Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's a. Yeah, you're right, Cherry. I haven't thought that through. That was one I just kind of brought up. I was just listening to Bob when he was thinking about the flexibility with the statute and where it might be in there. I see Bob's hands up again, so I haven't looked into that one. Go ahead, Bob. You're on mute. Yeah, the statute clearly states that the board may waive any limitations in that situation. So it might be a matter of timing if schools started and the number gets 
uh, change two days after we have a board meeting, you know, we might have to have a special meeting, but it'd be far simpler just to raise the number to 10 or something for a year or two and see how it goes. Uh, for the discussion from the board? I'll make a motion to set it at 10. Uh, Karen? Sorry to interrupt the vote. I, just as far as context, we typically do have some, some space. So um, to raising to 10, I wouldn't mean instantly we have 10 people at the door. So I do think that gives us some room for, for flexibility. Anna? I wonder if there's um, some space to move into like setting the limit at six and then each additional student, there would be some sort of review process so that we're not overstepping our boundaries by allotting too many students coming in, but also not having a strict restriction to six students. Uh, Matt, and then Ben? Um, I think, you know, Bob's points are, are well taken, but it, it sounds as if this can also be a burden on taxpayers if, if in fact it triggers greater expenses for our district and we don't know revenue flows in as a result. So my, my question is, would adding, you know, four more on top of the six, is that anywhere near like triggering the need for a new teacher um, so that our budget would increase or would that not even move the needle? So what, like, I mean, our class sizes are pretty small, um, you know, 80 students roughly. Uh, would adding four more put us in jeopardy of like more expenses? Um, yeah. for my, my place, I would say no, unless all of them happen to be in the exact same singleton class, say like AP physics or something small like that. So if, if every student was in a concentration like that, uh, I would say uh, distributing the, the capacity would not have an impact. Do, um, do you yeah, I mean, we still have discretion, right, Garen? If, if just because we said it at 10 doesn't mean we have to take the first 10 kids that show up. We still get to say, we don't think this is a good idea, Karen. That's Absolutely. Yep. Uh, this is an application process. This is so there's not a, a guaranteed in. Thanks, Ben. Okay. I think that may, Anna, I think that may address your concern that, you know, there's this degree of latitude. And that's the kind of decision making or evaluation that we would delegate to our administration. Yeah. Bob? Yeah, regarding budget, I think it's important to remember that in past years, the the student body has been hundreds more than it is right now. Um, but our budget hasn't gone down at all because we have fewer students now than we've had in the past. Uh, I think we'd have to go a long way before that many more students comes into the school body uh, before it would raise costs in any significant way. So I'm in favor of 10. Are we ready to vote? I think I got a second on my motion. I'll second. Thank you. Our second is the motion. Ben made the motion for 10. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, we are increasing the number to 10. <clears throat> Excuse me, 10. All right, we now have a budget workshop. We're gonna have Jim come up and dazzle us here. Um, so I think just to, to be helpful to set out uh, some some timeline here. Uh, this year, Jim had, had provided a, a really detailed breakdown, and the finance committee has been uh, meeting over the last uh, couple months. Our committee sessions, looking at early drafts of the budget. What we're seeing now is the uh, really the first look of the. Um, for the full board to see the expenditures that we're planning for FY25. And uh, it's gonna be um, really exciting. I hope everybody's buckled in. Um, but uh, some of the things that you know we, um, let me just continue with the, um, sorry, the schedule aspect. And what we're looking at is, you won't necessarily see this on the website, uh, is uh, the next committee meeting in, in two weeks. Um, that's been kind of earmarked for a, a special board meeting. We did the same thing last year, and we'll plan to do the same thing again this year. And at that time, 
we'll get into a first look at um, you know, tax rate impacts. But tonight is more about you know what what are the needs of the school district, where um, what are the recommendations that are being made, and what are the plans for expenditures for FY25. So with that, Jim. Okay. Rain, let me need to make you a co-host. Ray, can, can you let me share my screen? <clears throat> She's there. She's here. Oh, there she's right in the middle. The center square, Hollywood Square. <laughs> so we are dating us, huh? <laughs> just said it right about it. So we presented to finance committee last month a budget that was a few hundred thousand dollars more than what we ended up with presenting tonight. And um, finance committee would, would not give us any direction, but they kind of, you know, wish we hadn't weren't quite as high as we were. And so we went back as a team and we went through our uh, what we presented and we came forward with this budget. So the challenges that we're dealing with this year, and I know you've heard me talk about this, but um, health insurance is up 16.5% this year for next year. In the, in the five years period that ends in fiscal year 25, our health insurance has gone up 88%. So it's almost doubled in five years. And so that's a huge burden. We have people who work for us, their health insurance costs us more than their wages do. And so these are some of the things that we're dealing with. Um, some of the other things that are in this budget is we've got year two, year two of the support staff contract. Actually, I think it's year three of the support staff contract that was negotiated a couple of years ago. Uh, we have raises for non-union uh, staff, <clears throat> and I've got a placeholder for the teacher negotiations. Um, teacher negotiations is ongoing, uh, but I put some money in the budget. I hope it's close to what they've um, what they're going to settle at. But in the meantime, uh, that's where we are. Um, I'm sure you've heard some talk about the ESSER cliff or the COVID cliff on funding. There's so many districts that put a lot of staff into the ESSER funds. Um, we have one and a half people in ESSER this year. And so if we wanted to keep those people, these are both long-term people with our district who took a different job that we're able to fund under ESSER over the last three years, we had to bring them into the budget. So we've brought them into the budget. Uh, we also, in the budget, um, due to funding challenges with our entitlements, our IDEA grant, our Title I grant, our Title II grant, our Title IV grant, which are all federal entitlements. And because of the way the things that those formulas are based on, um, we're getting less money. We've had to pull two people, or the equivalent of a little over two people out of those grants and put them in the budget. Again, these are people who have been here a long time and um, remain here. Um, so going forward, for regular ed, our, our proposed budget for next year is 11,715,000, just 716,000, which is $1,679,000 more than this year. Health insurance, which is throughout this budget, not just in that line, is about $800,000 of our total increase. Okay. Special ed, um, is 3,635,378, up $600,000. I can tell you that that is because of out of district placements. That whole increase is a result of out of district placements that, that Shane is working on 
uh, trying to address, but right now the state has placed these students and we're responsible for these costs until further notice. Um, can you just elaborate on what that process is? So just other schools don't have the services, so they were asked to use ours? No, it's when you have a student that we, when we have a student that we can't provide the services for that student, they get, they get placed somewhere. And when we place them, we're responsible. This particular uh, placement is a rather expensive place. Now the state's involved in the middle of this and it's kind of gotten to be a kind of a mess, but it's a $600,000 impact for our budget. There's one student. And is it something we could have had the capacity to serve that student or is it just really not in our skill set? It's a residential placement, so it's not one that we have the capacity to handle. To um, Co-curricular co programs are up a little bit. Uh, that's the addition of one coach. That's addition of $30,000 of some funds to start doing some financial equity between our co-curricular programs. And that's for a couple minor um, increases in costs. Uh, student support services, it's down, but that's because it's been re reallocated somewhere else. Um, guidance services, uh, this is where one of the positions that we brought in from ESSER is now in the guidance department. And so that's part of that increase, not all of it, but that's part of that increase. Um, school nurses, quite honestly, we had a change of a couple of staff members and most of that is benefit costs because they went from a single to a family or something like that. Um, psychological services, um, minor changes because of the um, the people we have and the services that we've had to farm out in order to keep up with all of the compliance uh, testing. <laughs> Speech and other therapy services. It's a similar. Speech and other therapy services. Again, um, a lot has been contracted out. And um, thank you, sir. And um, those contracts continue to go up. Thank you. Um, Can I ask you what those other student services that's up five hundred and eighteen percent is? Line 2190. No, but I can tell you real quick. Yeah, I was like, that seems also the one for. I apologize, this is my mom's gift. No, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, that's what board does. It's not a Oh, like four thousand. Great, four thousand. I I'm not sure. Like, oh, there's the next piece. It was from four thousand. It's okay. It's normal. For an increase of twenty. So okay. Yeah. Oh, four thousand times five is okay. Is okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was like, we'll cover it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Also, we have school leadership up 2,804 percent. Oh, and you cost that much? That's <laughs> <laughs> <Not> cheap. <laughs> okay. Um...
So other, other student services 2190 is a reclassification of one of the positions that we had in a grant. Oh, okay. And I mean, it was fifteen thousand dollars in wages and benefits, yeah, yeah, but yeah. that's what it was. Okay. And the school leadership. I'm sorry, you're probably going to address them line by line. I'm jumping to them. Okay. The, the school leadership. Twenty two thirteen went from um, twenty two thousand dollars to six hundred and forty. Oh, I know, I know exactly what that is. <clears throat> um, two of the positions that were in Esser are here, and they're not all six hundred thousand of them, but they're about three hundred thousand of them. And um, I can find the rest. So of all three of those things are, are two positions. That we just mentioned. Those increases are all from two positions being filled, or am I understanding that correctly? Let me let me get to them. But maybe their question is how could it have only been twenty two thousand in twenty twenty four? And now it's over six hundred thousand. Yes. Yeah. No, I understand the question. I'm I'm doing my best, um, uh, Jim, impression here because he's Jim, not here. Jim Hat. Jim Hat. Oh, yeah. Going line by line, yeah. he would be so proud. <laughs> <laughs> the man rubbed off on me after eight years. <laughs> I assure you, Sam, that the finance committee did something very similar during our finance review of the numbers. <laughs> and Jim and Jim Half came up during that meeting also. <laughs> Lives on. Well, he makes quite an impression. So let me tell you what's in there. And none of these are new. That's just reclassified. So I'm thinking that it's reclassification. Okay. Um, so 2213, function code 2213 is all textbooks. And I know we spent more than 20 grand on textbooks oh. last year. Um, it is uh, books and periodicals, teaching and learning. Um, we have some stipends for for uh, professional development. There is two hundred fourteen thousand dollars in wages, which is the two positions. Okay. A little over two positions we put in there. Is Lori B like one of those positions? No. Okay. No. No, she's two two four one zero. Um, this also includes the $96,000 a year for, um, the, te the teachers under their contract, their tuition. So I'm going to tell you that there's something wrong with my comparison okay. to last year, because the number, the, 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 the items I'm telling you were in last year's budget. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And there's something wrong with, with, there, there with my documents. So I'll have to fix my document. Yeah, that's okay. I just see those big numbers. No, like, no. How, did that, how did that go that so, that big that fast? Jim, if there's kind of significant call outs in terms of big rocks, I guess let's do those. Otherwise, why don't we um, kind of get to the um, mm -hmm. the bottom line and then maybe folks can sit with it between now and the next budget session? Sure. <laughs> um, I don't know if there's any big call outs. Uh, the, um, there's a couple of things that are in here that are new this time. And that is the transfer to food service. We're budgeting $200,000 to transfer to food service, which we've never done before. Food service has always run in the negative, about $200,000. Mm -hmm. And it's always come out of whatever money's left is at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. 
we're actually budgeting as an expense item. Oh, okay. okay. And my comparison here is wrong, so I will have to fix it because we didn't have a million dollars last year mm -hmm. of transfer. So somewhere I've got a cross link here in my um, yeah, spreadsheet that I like to sense. fix. Um, the other the other thing that is important is this is year two of the debt service on the three new projects that were approved last March. And so we didn't have them in the budget when we developed them, but once the voters approved them, they got added to the budget for this year. And so this year it's a million one, next year it's a million seventy eight. And that also includes uh, the payment on um, the old high school project, which is still have three years left. Any That's those are the columns. Yeah, it looks like from a, a total increase. We're to, total increase was ten point seven six percent. Okay. <clears throat> the the major driver there, I think, is the staff positions. Um, that you talk about some of them being an ESSER. I mean, there are a handful of others. We want to kind of run down what those staff positions are. The staff positions were the things that we had to add to the budget was somebody mentioned Lori Beeland. Um, when we brought her in last year, you brought her in after you had, had approved the budget, after the voters had adopted the budget. So we put half of her in ESSER and half of her we paid with a vacancy. And so this year we have to fully fund her. And that was your intent last year was to create the position. Um, at Prosser Valley, um, we got a local grant that funded two positions in this year's budget, but only one of those positions next year budget. So we need to fund that. Um, those are those are two. We had the title positions, we had the ESSER positions. So we picked up a little over eight hundred thousand dollars in wages for these positions that were funded somehow other than through the budget. And then from our sessions, I recall there was the number of people that fit that same description. Somebody who was um, coming over to be bringing family members under their health insurance. Mm -hmm. um, that was, I think you called out maybe three or four different instances of that. That's yeah. Expensive. When we went through, because we were looking at line by line, we could see where an expense uh, health insurance had increased 300%. So it was the same person or a new person or just on family health insurance. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I really wanted to kind of give the overview there. I guess for comparison purposes, um, and we had kind of hoped we were laying this out. Each year, the um, the tax commissioner puts out what they call their December one letter. We just that was Friday, and that did come in on Friday. Um, I did want to speak to it a little bit because uh, it's it's alarming, and you see a number in the letter. Uh, that's thrown around uh, that um, the average you know property tax bills are set to increase by 18 and a half percent for FY25. That's almost in, uh, it's, uh, mostly driven by the, the pan, what I've called before the pandemic run on real estate, right? In the state of Vermont, you see the, the CLA uh, is a three year look back study. And those kind of chickens come home to roost after we saw, you know, everybody from Massachusetts and Connecticut and everywhere else in the country buying up real estate in Vermont in, you know, 2020, 21, 22. So that's that's the biggest part, and the the other aspect from the um, the yield letter. There's some pieces that you know uh, you've seen me kind of break down the different kind of budget drivers, and we'll do that in two weeks. But they they call out some of the exact same things: the 16 percent plus increase in healthcare benefits. That's a statewide thing that hits all school districts the same. The ending of the ESSER funds. That's something that Jim talked about. Uh, kind of a fiscal cliff there. Um, we were a little bit more disciplined. Um, across the state, you're looking at a an estimated 12% um, increase in school spending. So although you know you, you see this 10.7% that Jim's you know uh, developed and it seems eye popping, we're actually kind of better than the average as a school district. And then just overall inflation, wage inflation, 
And the last thing on the list that the tax commissioner cites is debt service to new capital projects, just as we had in our school districts. And he says, Vermont's aging fleet of schools is becoming more expensive to maintain and repair as they continue to age. So there's other call outs. And if anybody wants to read that, it's available online. Um, and if you have any questions, um, feel free to um, talk to me or Jen. But more to come in two weeks. All right. Are there any further questions for the finance committee? The finance gurus. Tell Jim, go home and go to bed. Get out. Uh, Ben's not going to let me. All right. Thank you very much. Um, the next order of business is we do have um, a union arena director resignation. Um, Jay Leiter has been on the, the board. He has two roles on that board, and he has decided the time has come for him to step down, and lo and behold, it's our job to find a replacement. So I've reached out to the other two um, directors, and um, they don't really have anything in writing about what you actually do and how often you meet. So <laughs> I've asked them to clarify that before we try to find somebody who would like to do that, but it would be wonderful if somebody through the hockey, hockey program would be willing to step up. I gather that they don't meet a lot in, and it's also an endowment association that, that Jay's been part of. I suppose that's for scholarships, but um, neither of the two directors have been too, um, haven't had a lot of contact, Brian Bontrager and um, Demo Voice. So once we uh, get a little more information, we will at some point have to appoint a director to replace Jay Leiter. If anyone would like to volunteer. No, just a question on how, how this works. So Union Arena is like a nonprofit. They have a board of directors and then we have a, as a district the right to put someone on the board. Is that what this is? Yes, we have to appoint that person. And that person doesn't have to be one of us on the board. No. This is appointed by us. Yes. Got it. <clears throat> so I've asked that they put forward some names. If they have any so far, they haven't put anything forward. This has been about a week. Now, so I got contacted. We we have two trust funds. One is the Poplin Trust, and the other is the Union Arena Trust. Right. And it's my understanding that the biggest role of this group is to meet quarterly and look at the financials, and then sign documents so we can withdraw funds, so we can do scholarships or. You remember a year, year and a half ago, you approved the arena spending some money. We're trying to withdraw some of that money now. So yeah. that's that's mostly when they meet. And quite honestly, I've been sending out the request for signatures by email, and they respond by email. Does anyone ask Bob Coates? No, but I could certainly ask him. Just as someone who was on this board and then is now very involved in hockey and the arena. Right. He probably did that. Thank you. And if you call it comes to mind any other suggestions, I'm happy to reach out to people and and put it forward. I don't think it like you said, Jim, it's not a huge job. Ray. I play a lot of hockey at Union Arena every week. I'm happy to get on that if you want somebody to come to the board. Great. You so are the man. If that helps, that's good. I got that. Jim, All right, Ray, thank you. It's a good ranking. All right, I will put your name forward to them. I think well, they'll thanks. be very happy. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, now we have the, the finance committee. Do you have anything else? To re no, nothing but just a reminder that we'll do our special board meeting on uh, 12 18 uh, during the regular committee meeting times. For those who aren't on committees, um, you know, that's going to be an extra meeting. So, are we going to have another meeting? We'll have to coordinate that. Okay. On Monday, we'll okay. All right. And I'm going to move this along. Okay, but you're bringing the spike back on practice. All right. Policy committee. So, we have a lot of policies. Uh, with uh, Raina or parliamentarian's permission, I'd like to actually do the first eight as a group. Is that okay? Since they're uh, the first three, We've already uh, read uh, twice, and so the first eight I'd like to present as a group uh, before adoption. I second that motion. I think uh, Ellie, you making that motion? 
Uh, I will make that motion and you can second it. Yes. And I second. Any questions for the policy committee before we vote? Any changes since the last three on any of these no. policies? No, so the first three are ones that we did discuss prior. There's been no changes, and the next uh, uh, the oh, other, okay. next five were all formatting, and they haven't been any ch changed at all. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Ladies, or raise your hand. No. Okay. Uh, Okay, and the next four are also formatting um, uh, changes uh, for the for these policies. These are presented as a first reading, and then I would like them uh, basically um, put forward for adoption for the January meeting. So skipping a secondary reading. So tonight would be basically first reading and for adoption next time. And again, they're formatting changes um, with the notes um, basically. Um, this is a BSBA thing that we're going through all these policies. We have other policies we're working on, but these are ones we have to get through. Okay. Uh, are there any questions, comments for the policy committee? Are we ready to vote to move it to um, a second reading? Or do a second one? Oh, yeah, it was, uh, it was yeah, closing at adoption. <laughs> no, no, these are, so these are, these are not adopted. These are first reading, and they will be for adoption in January, a little different than we normally do yeah. because they're only four minutes. So that's my motion. I guess I need that would be a second, so that would be adopted in January. First reading was adoption in January. Right. And is there a second? I'll second. I'll second. second. That was Donna. Yep. Any questions? Thanks, policy committee team. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Yeah, eight policy right in one meeting. Wow, <laughs> one minute, well, so. really. Well, that's on. pretty, it's like, that's a hard off. <laughs> Crazy day out there in the policy <laughs> world. <laughs> Building the ground committee. Um, sure, we did meet. I don't think Joe is here tonight. Is there a problem? Hiding back there. Sorry, Joe. Um, so we did meet. Um, we did go over current projects, the <clears throat> conversion of the heating system to hydronics. Um, the major outstanding item there is working on the, the backup boiler. Um, we then looked at the bids that came in for the HVAC system at Reading, and we recommended uh, Alliance Mechanical it was the lowest bid, and it met all of our qualifications, and they are experienced and have worked on the other schools. Uh, it was a total of two bids that came in. Um, and then we went over the projects that are proposed to be included in the fiscal year 2025 20, budget. Uh, Joe went through each of those and prioritized them, ranked them one through five, um, to help us get a sense of um, which ones, uh, if we had to cut them from the budget, which ones would come out first. Um, we voted to recommend that budget to the finance committee. I believe I don't have it in this notes, but I believe it was about 460,000 of, of projects for next year. And then uh, for new business, we talked about um, an RFP for the West HVAC systems once the engineering is complete for the, the design of that system. I think that covers it, Joe, but but every time we meet, you know, there's two weeks that go past. So there's a lot that happens in our buildings that Joe could update us on. Sure, just a brief update. So uh, we are still moving forward on the boilers downstairs. Uh, the second newer boiler, um, we're about halfway through rebuilding that one. We're actually taking apart by sections. We had some leaks in there. Uh, we we'll continue to move uh, slowly but surely with the building district with JCI. Uh, we did have an oil leak, uh, some home heating fuel oil in the basement at the high school, about 20 gallons Monday morning, uh, spilled onto the floor. It was a uh, relatively small leak. It was contained pretty quickly. Uh, environmental firm came in uh, really quick, and uh, we took some VOC readings. Folks were concerned about the order. We found zero parts per million in the school area in the uh, hallways there. Uh, we did uh, have some uh, higher readings in the basements, uh, nothing uh, that would cause anybody any harm well below the threshold levels. Um, so we followed the protocol, contacted the state, 
or an environmental firm. Uh, cleanup was pretty straightforward. They were back today, took some more readings. We found zero pretty much everywhere upstairs and where we had to spill. So uh, it was a small spill, it was contained quickly. And um, that's about it. I don't know if you have any questions. Do you know the root cause of the spill? How it happened? Yeah, it was human error. So we have a uh, 10,000 gallon oil tank in the uh, front of the school that's buried. We have one 275, which is kind of a homeowner sized tank in the basement. That 275 tank feeds a hot water heater for all the restrooms in the high school portion of the wing. It's been there for an awful long time. Um, I want to get rid of it. <laughs> it. It's not the best thing in the world. Uh, it's been there for 50, 40 years, been there for an awful long time. When I got here, I had some concerns about it being down there. I questioned it. They assured me that it needed to be there. It was the only way for that heater to function. I replaced the tank about four years ago, and I also placed a tray in the containment tray underneath that. Um, the, luckily, we did. That container caught uh, most of the fuel that was spilled. So um, I'm looking into uh, getting rid of that. Hopefully, we can. Um, my HVAC guy is out <laughs> right now on medical leave, but as soon as he gets back, we're going to try to figure out other options to get rid of that 275. So, so they just overfilled it? Is that what happened? In a nutshell. Yeah, yeah in a nutshell. Yeah. Someone forgot to set their timer. What was it the company was, I don't know if it's Dead River, I think it's Dead River we use. Um, was it their human error or was it, yeah, it was on the wrong part? Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Thanks for putting the tray there. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks for putting the tray there. Yeah. Man, building and grounds. Um, the uh, power outage uh, at West last week. Uh, oh, yeah. Learned that um, the uh, generator at West is out. Has been out for a couple of years. Is that on the list? And it's not a priority. It is not a priority. It's not on the list. And not many. I mean, Joe can speak to this. It has come up at a buildings and ground committee meeting. And really, only the schools that are used as emergency shelters have generators, right? And those are often paid for out of the town funds, not the school budget. Um, but for what Ben just referenced was was it last um, Monday? No, no, no it was later. Monday after Thanksgiving. Yeah, it was the Monday right after Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving um, power was out. Kids came to school. And they got the power back on, and I don't know exactly what time. Okay. Um, 30, Nick at 10. <laughs> 10. Well, historically, that, that generator at Woodstock uh, was uh, maintained by the town. And now that the town no longer has a shelter there, um, they're no longer putting money into it. It needs um, several thousand, if not tens of thousands of dollars worth of work. Um, it's large enough to power the whole building. Um, so if we were going to continue to use it as we can't use it, uh, we can use it as a shelter in place, but we can't use it as a town shelter. Um, we wouldn't need a generator anywhere near that size. My assumption would be we just want lights, maybe uh, power of the kitchen in the nurse's office, that type of thing. That's good context, though. None of the other elementary staff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I don't think the middle school, high school is. We do not. And, in, in general, I think there is a statute. I don't recall what it is. Um, without power in a school, we have to dismiss. Maybe one of the principals might know that, but I think there is an hour uh, limit of how long we can run without that. Our our battery backup lights, a couple hours, and then we go we to darkness. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Solar help? <laughs> yeah. Well, if, we have, if we have a battery, power back, walls. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, and, uh, and Green Mountain Power might like subsidize that. So sure. when, when we talked about it, that's kind of what we were thinking is rather than go back and repair and rebuild like diesel generators to go with yeah. um power walls when they're there's one right up the hill behind the school. <laughs> is there? Yeah. Is that your house? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, negotiations hiring the detention committee. Bryce and I are on that committee along with uh, Jim and Linda as our assistants. Uh, we have made quite a bit of progress in updating language and um, 
changing some of the, the language in the contract that uh, we all have agreed to. We still have some things that still need to be talked through. And um, we have made one uh, back and forth on uh, salary and money. So we have one more opportunity to exchange uh, new information to the um, team. And then we have a meeting next Wednesday, I believe it is, to talk again. So we probably won't wrap it up in December, but um, we're getting somewhere and it's been mostly congenial. Any working groups? Got to Newville. Um, we had a, a great uh, building tour on uh, Tuesday last week. Probably 50 people or so showed up. Um, great job by Joe is always uh, leading the tours. I was big enough to go into two groups. Uh, Cody Tancredi did a great job with the uh, other side. Our architect, Lee Short, was there in person. Uh, it was a really tough crowd. Like there were people who were adamantly opposed to the project and kind of throwing fastballs uh, the whole time. But um, as is, um, you know, kind of the, the best use of those sessions after the tour is we got into a discussion. And when people talk and they can get the information and sit with it, I think it, uh, it goes a long way towards helping people make up their minds and seeing that, you know, this isn't unnecessary or extravagant. It's um, you know, been working on it a long time. Um, you know, hearts and minds, <laughs> um, you know, one, one session at a time. Um, we've decided to do two more uh, building tours. Um, like I said, we'll get the costing for the, the project on uh, Friday. That'll get beaten up by the owner's rep that we've just hired. We'll get a final number for the board as we come closer to budget season. Once we have that, that's what we'll take out to those, um, those building tours. And then we'll also do road shows at each of the towns or it could be a couple that are combined um but uh, in the yeah, stretch but, uh, we're not, uh actually we're relying on, on board members to kind of coordinate their communities or yeah, yeah. we'll the, oh, the building tours yeah yeah tours, but I, somebody who's interested if it couldn't make them yeah not not yet but we'll get okay. those out here in a, a week or so so but yeah uh lots of good kind of momentum there on the the build front okay <clears throat> We need to approve the minutes from the previous meeting. Are there any corrections? All right. And, um, somebody make a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, Tom is, we're just moving into public comments, so you are free to ask your question. I'm All righty. Uh, thank you for okay. noticing my raised hands. I was just curious as to which of the two executive sessions has been um, deleted tonight and whether there will be any decision in public session when you come out of. Uh, Number nine, the employment matter, we, we don't have a need for that. The contractual matter, I don't expect a decision to be made. Carrie, that's very help. Carrie, that's very helpful. Thank you very much, and to everyone, have a good evening. Thank you, Tom. All right, is there any other public comment? We welcome public comment here. So, all right, and then at this time we will uh, have a motion, please, to move into an executive session to discuss a contractual matter. So moved. So moved. Okay, we have exited the executive session with no decisions made, and now we have an opportunity to reflect upon our meeting, which might be almost historically early. Yeah, especially during um, uh, budget conversations, that does not happen. I was like, I'm going to be home at 9 30, just so you guys know. Like, when I left today. Well, it shows you what happens when you have limited or no special program events. Yeah. Maybe you should think that you could limit them a little bit. Yeah. Carrie, honestly, yeah. uh, I see your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to apologize to everyone. I didn't see the email about the 5 30 meeting. So I uh, saw it at like 6 25, and I apologize for missing that. And 
will do my best to keep on top of the last 24 hours before school board meeting emails. Yeah, yeah. no, we, uh, I think we handled it well. And uh, they really wanted to talk about the facility for the most part and the portrait of a graduate and how that was working out. And that was kind of the gist of it, right? Yeah. yeah. So um, it, it was like a 45 minute conversation, but Crane came in for the last 15 minutes or so. So there were four of us, which was respectable. So thank you. I just want to say a highlight of the meeting for me was Ray Rice volunteering for the Union Arena Board. Ray Rice, yes, yeah. ma'am. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there a um, motion to adjourn? Yeah, on a that, is there a second? Second. All right. Thank you, Lara. All in favor? Aye. Uh, All right. Thank you. Make sure you put that thing on the calendar. <laughs> Two weeks we do another full board meeting. Yeah, we'll do tax and fax. No, yeah, it's just budget. It's not like we won't have like no one will have it, but we'll have the committee. But all boards, yeah, the whole board. And that's two weeks from today, so that's what 18th. Yeah, that's the end of Hopefully, we can get it in the form. Or you can be disappeared by out. Okay, that's good. Zoom please. Send people's numbers. Well, you know.